have a roll call, please, Chloe. Council Member Bertrand. Present. Council Member Brooks. Here. Council Member Brown. Present. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Here. And Mayor Story. Uh, here. Um, and Chloe, do you want to make a uh, preliminary announcement for us? Sure. Thank you, Mayor. In accordance with California Senate Bill 361, this meeting is not physically open to the public. Council and staff are meeting via Zoom, and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting using Zoom or a landline or mobile phone, along with how to submit public comment during the meeting tonight, is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, and on the published meeting agenda. The public can also live stream the meeting on our website and our YouTube channel. As always, the meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. And our technician tonight is Olivia. Thank you so much, Olivia. And thank you, Mayor Story. Yeah, thank you, Chloe. And uh, also thank you, Olivia, uh, for handling our technology tonight. And welcome to all those future viewers that may uh, tune in. Um, so at this time, we'll have a Pledge of Allegiance. And um, if I may, I'll ask uh, Council Member Brooks if she'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. My pleasure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Do we have any additions, deletions to the agenda this evening? Staff has no changes to the agenda this evening. Okay. Any additional material? No, none were received, Mayor Story. Now um, we'll have uh, oral communication from members of the public. Um, this is an opportunity for members of the public to address the city council on items that are not on tonight's agenda or are on the consent agenda uh, for this evening. Uh, if you would like to speak, uh, you can raise your hand in Zoom um, or do dial star nine. The moderator will give you up to three minutes to speak. Um, you may also send an email to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Um, and Larry, I'm not, I'm noticing that we have no attendees. We, I don't see any attendees at this point and we do not have any emails. Okay. I'm going to move us forward then on to the next item, which is uh, uh, staff and city council comments. Do we have any staff comments? I don't believe we have any comments for the council this evening. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Um, council member comments? Um, council member Bertrand? You're on mute still? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yes, on. Um, on the AAA advisory board, and yesterday I was at the meeting at 10 o'clock in the morning, and uh, some very distressing news was uh, relayed to all of us. Um, I think it came about a day earlier, but we had discussion about it. So um, a lot of you are aware of the uh, Mid-County um, Senior Services. There, there's uh, Senior Network Services, uh, um, a whole mess of other things that are senior related. Uh, the most uh, big one is the one that delivers food to people around the county. And um, so they're being evicted. The uh, land, the building is owned by Live Oak School District and they just received a six month eviction notice. Um, a lot of the mayors are getting together around the county. Uh, uh, Sandy is reaching out around um, in Santa Cruz. So this is very important, <laughs> the fact that the facilities to prepare food um, and the congregate setting there, um, senior network services, which provides a lot of uh, counseling to people who are going on to Medicare, 
then need to figure out um, you know, which program to take. Uh, they provide many other services, but this has been a critical uh, senior service hub in uh, Santa Cruz County for a long time. It's part of the uh, district or the county plan. Um, so as you can imagine, the scramble, uh, and I, you know, I have no idea what the future is. Uh, people um, are meeting, I believe, um, like Manu, Zach, and, and others are trying to come together with uh, the school district to figure out um, how to move forward. Um, I'm not part of those discussions, but um, I, I do think that we should get involved on some level. Uh, Jamie, if you could reach out to other city managers, because I don't know how many hundreds of people, for instance, in Capitola are receiving food and other services from these facilities. But it's a great concern uh, to me, and I think it's gonna have a huge impact on the county of Santa Cruz. It's not just Capitola, but it's all of the county. Uh, food deliveries um, are from the summit all the way down to you know every single city, Watsonville, Santa Cruz, all over the place. So it's gonna have a severe impact for seniors in this whole county. And uh, I think, the, I just don't know how it's gonna be moved forward to uh, deal with this issue, I, I really don't. Um, so, um, well, thank, thank you, John, for, for bringing up that uh, sobering news. It's uh, pretty sobering, actually. <laughs> and, um, well, and just, uh, um, you know, that location is the central kitchen uh, right. for the Meals on Wheels, uh, both congregate dining centers. Right. And those are all of them throughout the county, um, as well as the um, um, home delivery meals program. So that is going to be a critical service that we need to make sure that is not interrupted, um, you know, if this move uh, does need to take place. But um, yeah, I would certainly like to, um, you know, get involved and see what I could do um, um, to kind of bridge um, this uh, transition. Um, yeah, I think the mayor, yeah. I, I think just to continue, I, I, I did get a sense that the, the mayors of the various cities are going to try to get together because, you know, they're, they're the, the heads of basically the city and provide the services and, you know, try to keep things going. So, yeah. Just, I know that's happening, so let's start letting you know, too. Okay, thank you. I, and I expect it'll come up through the Mayor Select Committee. Probably, um, yeah. So, uh, do other council members um, have any um, comments or announcements? Um, seeing none, um, I just, I wanted to make uh, one, I think, acknowledgement, recognition, and praise to uh, Chief Valley. Um, under the Capitola PLA for sponsoring the Skate Cola event last Saturday, uh, May the 14th uh, at uh, McGregor Park. Um, it was a spectacular event. There were dozens of uh, young kids there um, um, showing off their athletic skills. Um, they were all very impressive. Um, and there were, of course, there were many parents who were in attendance. Um, and um, so it, it was a fabulous event. Um, it was very well uh, sponsored by local businesses. I know the Santa Cruz Boardroom was a sponsor, um, and the Santa Cruz Apparel was a sponsor. Um, I, I don't want to, you know, miss anyone, but uh, there were many um, business um, sponsorships uh, that uh, made the event happen. Um, so I just wanted to encourage the, the city council to um, support this event. Um, you know, as it you know comes around, hopefully it can be an annual event. Um, and um, because it's great to support the kids um, and and their um, skateboarding skills, and it's also great to see our police officers interacting, um, you know, with these kids um, in that in that environment. Um, uh, through that sport. So uh, I just wanted to uh, say congratulations, Chief Dallas, and to all the POA and the officers who were there. Um, it, it, it was wonderful. So, um, so um, is there, was there 
Chief Alley, I don't. Was there a, a major sponsor that I should have mentioned that I that I maybe missed that you want to acknowledge? Uh, thank you, Mayor Stern. Thank you for your comments, and <clears throat> I know that the council supports it and the city supports it. Uh, really, the, another big sponsor was our own rec department. Nikki and her staff really helped out, and then um, Josh from the Mercantile. So he's the man of many hats, and so he donated um, his three up front and sausage work and his daily grind. So those are kind of the, with the boardroom, the Santa Cruz Apparel, they were kind of the keynote sponsors. But definitely a city sponsored event and the POA was a huge, uh, huge support financially as well. So great event, we're gonna keep it going. Um, and so thank you so much, I appreciate it. I'll, I will let our staff know as well. Yeah, all right, thank you. Um, and um, so with that, I see no other council comments. I'm gonna- There's one more comment. Um, Okay, go ahead, uh, Councilmember Bertrand. Yvette, aren't you going to say something about your organization's uh, participation? I have salad in my teeth. I'm sorry. What what organization? What thing? Well, um, you know, I was there too, and, and I met two uh, ladies there, and they said that they were part of your organization and had a table there for reaching out to youth. So. Yeah. Um, I was very impressed with uh, your staff members and uh, very enthusiastic and they gave me a description of what your organization does and it sounds like it's Aww. really a wonderful thing to have in this community. So. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand. Yeah, Your Future is Our Business is, is doing great things in the community supporting students and um, and to what was at the event, Chief Daly, you also had the Youth Action Network there. Um, tabling, and they are one of our partners for Capitola City Council um, in engaging youth in the community and um, and really collaborating right now with the, the uh, your department, Chief Daly, and um, with Parks and Rec. So thanks, Councilmember Bertrand, for reminding me. Thank you for the shout out. I can't forget because they were one of well, aside from the little kids, little kids, aside from the kids that were showing their stuff, they were very enthusiastic. And I just have to remark, first of all. Um, I saw some of the earlier events I had to go somewhere. So, uh, but the little kids that were doing their best and the parents watching them, it was really a treat, <laughs> very much a treat. That's great. great. Thank you, Councilmember Bertrand, for uh, bringing that to our attention. Thanks for uh, filling us in, Councilmember Brooks. Um, seeing no other council comments, I'm going to take us to the consent. Uh, agenda tonight you know there's only one item that you approve the minutes of the may 4th 2022 special meeting um does any council member want to pull this item for for more discussion seeing none is there a motion to approve the move to approve a second okay there's a motion by vice mayor kaiser and a second by council member brown um can we have a roll call vote please uh, Council Member Bertrand. I approve. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously, which will bring us to item uh, 7A, uh, which is the uh, the order of, of business for this evening, which is the presentation of the proposed fiscal year 22-23 budget for the city of Capitola and the Capitola Successor Agency. Um, and just to confirm that our recommended action is to uh, is acting as the city council and as the successor agency is to receive the proposed budget and provide staff direction. And we can either continue these budget deliberations to the next regularly scheduled joint budget hearing on June the 1st, or direct staff to prepare the documents for final budget adoption at the regular meeting in June and cancel future planned budget hearings. So with that, we have a staff presentation, please. Sure, I'll just kick things off really quickly before turning it over to the finance director, Jim Malberg. Um, Mayor Story, I think he gave a pretty good summary of what we're doing this evening. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to circle back on some of the questions that were identified at the first budget hearing, provide a little bit of um, 
sort of staff level cleanup and also a few little tweaks based on the council feedback we got last meeting. Identify any additional um, items the council would like us to cover and then we'll have to make a decision if we're gonna go to another budget hearing or if council would be ready to adopt uh, later on in June. So with that, Jim, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, good evening, Mayor Council. Let me take a moment to share my screen. Does that look okay, Larry? Yeah, that looks great. Thank you. So um, I think uh, both the mayor and, and our city manager gave a good overview of what we're doing tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started with the summary kind of recapping our last meeting and then kind of get into what we're talking about tonight. So um, the proposed general fund budget as it sits right now, uh, we're estimating an ending fund balance in June of 2023 of 1.3 million. As a reminder, we also have $385,000 set aside in the resiliency account. Um, so there is a potential to utilize fund balance in this coming fiscal year, whether we do that um, through this proposed budget or whether we come back at mid-year, um, we will have the ability to do that at some point this year, should the council choose. Um, as a reminder, we have a little over $3.5 million allocated to city council goals. And on our five-year forecast, um, beginning next year, we start using measure F to balance it out, which works until um, measure F sunsets in December of 2027. So as far as the multi-year budget projection, these are at the top, the blue box area shows our revenue projection. So fairly conservative uh, revenue projections going out. Also down towards the bottom, this is to measure F to operations, um, starting in fiscal year 2024 at 165 and kind of increasing there until that sunset. Um, that gets us a, this year in fiscal year 2023, we're uh, out of balance, structurally out of balance by design as we program um, available resources to city council goals, but we are balanced uh, fiscal year 2024 through 27, and then you'll see when measure F expires, there at the end we come out of balance, so we'll have to address that in the coming years. As far as the general fund summary, um, we're at 19.6, almost 19.7 million of revenues. That's up slightly from the last meeting, and I'll, I'll get into that. Um, the 22.2, almost 3 million of expenditures um, is up slightly, also from last time, and I will tell you that as well. And our impact on fund balance is, as I said, what we're going to um, spend almost 2.6 million more than we're bringing in, but that's by design, and we'll still leave us with a 1.3, almost 1.4 million dollar budget fund balance. And then when we um, account for the resiliency account, that takes our estimated ending fund balance to. 1.75 million in June of 2023. As far as some of the key items we covered on May 4th, uh, staffing, if you recall, we're uh, requesting to return two and a half positions that were frozen during the pandemic. We're also requesting to add 1.8 positions, uh, one in public works, and then the 1,700-hour wet coordinator position that I'll do by starting June day, um, participate in June day management. But we are maintaining um, one frozen three-quarter time position and three partially filled positions that total 1.75 in whole when you add them all together. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, our early childhood and youth program or ECYP funding, we're estimating revenue this year of 60 or fiscal year 2223 of 61,000. We also are estimating a bit beginning fund balance of 51,000. That's down from the first hearing. Um, since the first budget hearing, I got together with our, our recreation manager, uh, Nikki, and there was $30,000 of ECYP funding for the current fiscal year. And um, I'm working with Nikki to get that allocated out for the things that um, it was um, allocated for. So we'll get, we'll get that 30,000 out. We also um, adjusted our um, revenue estimate up a little bit. So the net of those two changes is taking that fund balance beginning next year to 51,000. <clears> and then again, the general fund balance estimated uh, in June of next year at 1.3 plus the resiliency account. Some minor budget adjustments that we've made since May 4th. So if you recall, um, on when we put together the proposed budget, we, I didn't have a really good feel for what the outdoor dining program was gonna look like after May 31st. Council kind of um, set the parameters up for that. So we bumped up um, village, I'm calling it parking revenue. That's really the revenue that will be generated.
generated from the parking spaces gen, uh, dedicated to outdoor dining. Right now we've gotten applications for 24, so I'm running the 24 spaces. Um, police department staffing. So I, this is the um, kind of cleanup that Jamie was mentioning. I had a map error and I had two positions reversed. So cleaning that up is an increase in the budget of um, 31,750. But what that is is really more cleanup. It's representative of the current staffing down in PD. Um, it's not building up. I think we're bumping, asking to take the admin analyst on a permanent basis to full time. Um, but that was that was in the request last time was just more cleanup. Um, city council training. Uh, we had missed this one last time, so we're bumping that budget by seven thousand, which returns to our pre-pandemic uh, level of two thousand per council member. We've also increased our training budget by $5,000 uh, for implicit bias training. We're putting that into the um, personnel division within the city manager's department, and it is a single line item that we will budget for every year for transparency, and that's to provide the ongoing training for both elected officials and staff for implicit bias. Um, regional homeless response, we're decreasing the general fund contributions to half by $30,000. And basically what we're doing um, is we, we contribute just under $40,000 a year to half, which is the Homeless Action Partnership. Um, 30,000 of that is for homeless shelter costs. We're moving that from the general fund into the special revenue fund, which is an eligible expense of that fund. So we're, we're moving it, but not, we're still funding the program. It's just not coming out of the general fund. Um, the art and cultural budget, we're increasing by $1,500 for uh, the program in the Begonia Seminar Club event. And then also universal park design. We'll have some more info on this later, but that's the um, accessible play structure, moving that project from the library to um, the J Street Community Center and Park area. So we do have some additional items to cover that were mentioned in the staff report. And um, just kind of a summary of those is listed here on the slide. I I think I need to read each one, but basically the first eight, we will have um, deeper discussion as we go through the presentation this evening. The bottom two, the report on the city's liability risk, um, is going to come from a memo outside of the budget hearings from the, to the council from the city attorney, and city council compensation will also be outside of the budget hearings, and um, the fact had a meeting on Tuesday of this week, and we put that on the agenda for our regular meeting in July. So with that, I'm going to get into some of the additional items and turn this over to City Manager Goldstein. Thank you, Jim. So there was a question at the last meeting about how online sales tax works for the City of Capitola that we've seen impact from the shift uh, from brick and mortar sales to online sales. Short answer is yes. Um, you can see here in this table, in 2017, we were getting about 170 to $187,000 a quarter um, from online and used auto sales. And in 2021, that shifted up to between 250 and gosh, 370, it looks like. So the way online and used auto sales works is that all those sales that take place in the county, so any online transactions by anyone in the county, goes what's into, it's called the county pool. And then what happens is the county pool gets distributed back to the cities based on our percentage of brick and mortar sales in the county. Historically, Capitola has been around 15% of the brick and mortar sales in the county. And you can see that back in 2017 where our, 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 our percentage allocation from the pool fluctuated between 15.6 and 14.4%. Um, that has trended downward in recent years. And you can see this last year in 2021, it was between 11.8 and 13.8. And the downward trend is probably just another symptom of the longer term trend we've seen in Capitola where our sales tax hasn't kept up with inflation. So that probably countywide it is, but ours is sort of gradually eroding to some degree. Uh, an explanation of how this came to be, I think used auto sales historically were difficult to pin to an address. So that was, I think, the origin of this county pool. And then when online sales first showed up, uh, the State Board of Equalization just said, this is the way to do it. We'll dump it in the pool and then just allocate it. 
Um, obviously, um, it's becoming a larger and larger source of revenue, which has resulted in more and more focus by different cities on this. So it is actually something that I'm, I'm working actually at a state level for a lead committee that's looking at sales tax because there was a push by some cities to reform this mechanism for distribution of online sales recently, uh, which would have a pretty significant negative impact on Capitola. My, based on the estimates that we have done internally, we think that if this mechanism was shifted, we probably would end up getting, you know, between four and 5% of the countywide pool. Um, and so you can see that would be a pretty significant hit to our budget if we shifted from averaging around 12 to 13 percent to four to five percent. So it's something I'm definitely tracking. Um, and there's and there and it's probably going to be an ongoing issue as more and more sales shift online. The next slide, Jim. Then the other question I was going to cover tonight was about the Monterey Bay Self-Insurance Authority and how our premiums this year for liability in particular had gone up pretty significantly. So just a little bit of background, Monterey Bay Self-Insurance Authority, we call it Ambasia, is a partnership with nine other cities where it's a 10-city joint powers authority. And basically it's an insurance and work comp insurance entity for all the member agencies. Uh, so we effectively operate as a, our own insurance company, if you will. Mm -hmm. We also, in Ambasia, provide programs to purchase property insurance, crime, cyber, some of these other kinds of policies that the city uh, buys. But the cost, the premiums basically get distributed to the cities based on a city's size and a city's history, their claims history, all that experience. And in general, our costs as member agencies will change because either A, the overall budget for insurance has gone up, which is happening, <laughs> and I'll talk more about that in a second, or as an individual city, you're having a lot of claims, in which case your costs can be rising because your experience factor is going up. So here we'll go to the next slide. So the first little chart up there, this isn't our data actually, this is from a, a a JPA of JPAs that provides excess insurance coverage it's called PRISM. And PRISM often will cover cities for Ambasia for claims beyond a million dollars. And you can see that 10 years ago, statewide, there was about 60 active claims of a million dollars or more. And that number is almost up to 160 today. And it's not necessarily due to more claims, more problems in cities. It's part of almost exclusively due to claims escalation that particularly over the last three years with so much attention on policing and public safety, the jury awards, what maybe historically previously was a $2 million award is suddenly a $4 million award. And maybe what a $5 million award is now 10. And in addition, there's been some just astronomical claims um, that have been paid out, particularly in the by some public agencies, more of the universities around sexual harassment or misconduct. Um, I believe that there's been some claims, US, USC I think had a billion dollar claim and the University of Southern California, or University UCLA had multiple hundred million dollar plus claims, which has the effect of basically freezing out the insurance market. That the people that provide this insurance are like, whoa, <laughs> you know, we, we can't get in this market to provide coverage for these things because these costs uh, could just be so, so exorbitant. Uh, so on the liability budget in Ambasia, we share, we split the costs up 50% based on payroll, that's the size of a city, and 50% based on experience. Capitola, um, we represent about 10.3% of the Ambasia payroll. We are essentially the average city with 10 cities with 10% of the overall payroll. And that's a pretty constant number. Um, our claims history on liability is the variable. Uh, this year, we are 11.5 of the claims history during the period of time that we look at. Uh, and interestingly, that has been relatively constant during my tenure on the Ambasia board. You know, sometimes we'll dip below 10%, sometimes we've gone a little bit above, but we're pretty close around that, that 11, 10, 11, 9%, which is actually a little bit interesting if you think about the Ambasia membership, which is includes a lot of cities that don't have the same risk profile that we do. Uh, there's Salinas Valley cities, Scotts Valley, um, Marina, and those cities generally don't have the same level of tourist traffic and the same level of commercial activity taking place in the city. 
So it is interesting that we tend to be an average claim city, even though in some ways we probably have a different risk profile. So what the increase, we saw a 19% increase in our premium this year, and overall our embasure and liability budget increased at 16%. So we were tracking pretty close there. We got a little teeny bump, a 3% bump from experience, and we'll look at that in a second here. And the 16% budget bump in our overall budget is because our excess carrier, um, we don't use PRISM, we actually use Karma, but I got the PRISM data more easily. Karma, um, our, that's our cost for excess insurance, went from 750 a year ago to next year's budget. We think it's going to be 1.6, 1.7 million. So Karma is kind of blowing up. You know, they're, they're, they're looking for way more money because they have so many high cost claims coming in. And so in addition, we've also... Uh, the Ambasia board moved our, how much, how confident we are in our fund. So each year we get an actuarial report that says, here's how much money you should put aside. And there's recommendations, like if you want to be 50% sure that you have enough money each year, you fund it level X. And if you want to be 60% sure, you love, fund a little bit more, 70% sure you want to fund a little more. We actually moved our confidence level up this year because we don't seem to be catching up as fast as we would like in our overall financial position and trying to get ourselves um, stabilized as an insurance company, basically. So those are the reasons for the 16% increase, and that's the primary driver between our 19% overall liability budget increase. Next slide. Can I get the next? Uh-oh. Thank you. Can folks hear me okay or am I frozen? We can hear you, but we can't see you. Well, I, I, I can hear you and see you, Jane. Oh, okay. You guys can hear me and see me. It's, I, yes, and heard you. <laughs> and heard me. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry, I'm folks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's back up one slide, Jim. For whatever reason, everyone was frozen there on my screen for about a minute. So this is how we look at the um, basically the loss run to generate the experience factor. Losses were 902, which made up 11.5 percent of the overall claims experience. Again, You'll notice um, Jamie, second from the through what? Yeah, you're Jamie. You're cutting in and out. Oh boy. Yeah. Maybe just go audio. I'm afraid I'm still frozen. And if you if you can go just audio, turn off your video, it sometimes helps. Well, Am I back? You're back. All right. I'm not sure what's going on. I will keep forging ahead and text my family to make sure they're staying off YouTube. Uh, so the second type of increase that agencies can experience, and we did experience after 2011, is, is just a rash of claims. Uh, in 2011, we had a lot of claims associated with the flood. And so you can see the city second from the bottom there represents 28% of Ambase's overall claims. And that's when, um, that's when you got to pay attention and figure out what's going on. And we've seen that over my tenure on Ambasia, sort of claims histories move around from city to city. Sometimes they're associated with police departments that are having issues. Sometimes they're associated with sewer issues, um, those kinds of things. And they're always, it's a different answer about what's going on and whether it's just bad luck or whether it's management issues that can be corrected. Next slide, please. On the work comp budget, we share, um, so work comp is insurance that we buy to cover the costs associated with uh, injuries in the workplace. Those costs are 25% payable and 75% experience. So we more heavily weighed experience in Asia. And again, on payroll, we do payroll a little bit different on work comp than we do on liability, which I don't totally know why. We're 11.3% of the overall payroll, which is a constant. And, we are about 5.6 of the Ambasia work comp claims, which that number moves around. Um, 
Interestingly, Capitola has historically been low on work comp, um, which is a good thing. Uh, so you'll see that we are half basically of our expected work comp claims increase. And overall work comp claims increased 11%, primarily due to medical costs. And our premium this year only increased 4% because our, our claim history got even a little bit better from where it was before. And then next slide. This is, sorry, the numbers are teeny here. This is again, how we look at kind of the work comp budget, the claims history. You can see our total there is 5.6% of the total incurred losses over the period of time. Uh, and that's how we come up with that portion of the budget. So that I think concludes the Ambasia budget review and online sales tax. And Mr. Mayor, if you'd like to pause, I can answer questions or we can keep forging ahead. Let's see if there's any questions at this point. Do any of the council members have questions? Yes, council member Bertrand. Yeah, um, do we look at our Ambasia costs and, uh, excuse me, our experience, sorry, and internally try to uh, manage that better? Is there an effort, city, city um, management side effort on that? Yes. Simple answer is yes. Um, we, we have programs at Ambasia that help cities reduce liability. And so we actually rolled out a program that our public works department is working on right now, where we have an overall contractor who's doing sidewalk assessments and grinding for all the member cities um, to try to reduce trip and fall liability. Um, and I'm always monitoring, we're always monitoring the claims. And if we see patterns to the claims, we'll investigate. I will share with you one story where King City, you may remember from the news maybe seven or eight years ago, had a terrible problem with their police department. Um, there was a federal investigation. I think a number, a number of officers and I believe the police chief were caught up in a, a, a system where cars were being taken um, from residents. And we saw some huge claims come out of the King City Police Department. And actually we ended up at Ambasia as a board basically putting them on probation and saying, unless you make these following corrections to your police department, we're going to stop, we're going to kick you out. You're not going to be insured anymore. <laughs> so both at a local management level and at the Ambasia board level, we are actively monitoring. And when cities run into trouble, there's often conversations about what, what needs to be done to fix it. Yeah, I thank you for that. I'm glad you're involved in that on both levels. Great. Thank you. Any other council members have questions? Yeah, why don't you go ahead, Jen? Okay. <clears throat> so um, we're going to move on to the Early Childhood and Youth Program Fund. The, um, these are restricted funds, as you're all well aware, that uh, can only be used for early childhood and youth programming. There is currently an ad hoc community grant um, committee that recently reviewed potential uses and I believe is recommending um, utilizing the reoccurring ECYT to finding enough funding of 61,000 for our community grant program and then utilizing the 51,000 of fund balance in our recreation division. Um, so we, that'll come back towards the end of that to get some council direction on those two, two items. And then just as a reminder, that community grant strategic plan will be considered uh, next week at the city council meeting. I think um, I saw Mickey is on the call. I think for these next few bullet points, I'm going to uh, have her go through those because she's way more well versed on these than I am. Yes, thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor, Council members. Um, I'm here to talk about the recreation division proposal for the ECYP fund. Before I dive in though, um, I don't want to forget that council in our last meeting had also requested um, an update on recreation meetings with the library around programming. And I wanted to let you know that um, the library and I have been in communication, um, but we've had trouble scheduling uh, in order to have that meeting. It is planned for next week and staff will return with an update when there's more information later. Um, so on to the recreation division proposal. Um, so currently recreation receives uh, any level of scholarship
scholarship fund that goes to youth from uh, different organizations such as the, the school district or the community foundation and all of those funds are restricted to specific programs such as uh, junior guard or after school. Um, so staff's proposal for a lar the largest amount is to allocate um, $39,000 for a scholarship fund for youth programming in a more general sense. Um, so this would be funds that would be available to anyone that would apply for and, and new to recreation would be youth classes um, through our class program. Uh, it would continue to have after school Camp Capitola Junior Guards as well, um, but also would go towards any youth um, park RX uh, request that we might have. Um, with this current amount, uh, I, staff would anticipate that this would be about two years, slightly less than two years of complete funding based on our current activities of request. Um, if there was no other source of funding, we do continually get funding from the Capitola Community Foundation. Uh, we've yet to have a conversation with the school district as to whether or not they will continue funding um, after school. Um, even on a, on a different level than what they've done in the past due to the pandemic. Um, an, an, another portion of uh, this fund, staff would request a uh, proposal to have $10,000 allocated to a swim lesson equity program. Um, so currently, junior guards, um, in order to participate in the program, they need to know how to swim. They need to be and have enough skill and confidence to be able to start the program um, on the first day and get through the basic swim test appropriate for the age um, in order to continue in the program. Um, and so staff is concerned about that barrier and would like to have a, a small amount of money in order to help uh, under-resourced youth have access to swim lessons and help to break down uh, a lot of the barriers that prevent those youth from getting to swim lessons. Um, staff intends to involve uh, agency partners uh, within the county in order to try and get this program up and running. And um, a lot of this funding would go towards staff hours, school rental, and any equipment that would be necessary to serve those youth. And then the final smaller dollar amount of $2,000 would be to provide some additional resources to Recreation's current job skills program. Uh, we currently offer two for teen youth in our community, our Capitola Junior Leaders, as well as our Capitola Junior Guard Captain Corps. Um, both of these programs have parts of the program where they are shadowing staff and they are um, getting volunteer hours working directly with youth, this funding would go towards um, providing services, much like how uh, staff currently provide um, contracted services to train regional staff. So for example, we've had an ongoing partnership for positive discipline, then they train staff um, in order to have this resource and connection with youth that they work with. So this would help to extend those resources and our job skills um, training program. And um, with that, I am able to answer any questions or you seem to continue on with the webinar. Council Member Bertrand, you're on mute. Yeah, hey, I'm mixing up programs. Uh, you also had a program for a summer camp. Uh, is that going to be reported on later or is that just not part of this? I'm just trying to understand. The Excuse summer camp program here you started last year. Um, are you thinking about the family camp program? The family camp, okay, not summer, family camp during the summer. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it would have happened in the summer. Um, yeah, so the, the family camp program, um, we came upon some challenges in order to be able to operate. The first one that we had attempted to run did not 
hit the minimum number of enrollment. Um, and so we were not able to run that one. We did continue it in the budget, um, but with the staffing resource that recreation had in order to get it up and running, um, did not feel confident that it would uh, be a successful program. Um, currently, it's not in this budget, but um, I've had conversations with um, staff in the city of Watsonville as well as the county, and we're going to, over the year, explore a partnership in order to attempt to bring this back as a little bit more of a countywide initiative. Um, but those conversations still need to happen. Well, thank you, Nikki, for attempting, I mean, attempting that originally and then being there was some stumbling that you're trying to find another solution to that. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Question from any other council members? Nikki, I had a question about the scholarships and the swim uh, lesson equity. Mm -hmm. uh, how many scholarships and how many swim lessons do you think you would be able to provide for that amount of money? Um, that's a great question. The, the challenging part about it is it's a little bit cart before the horse. Um, based on um, some preliminary feasibility for this, I feel that we would be able to get um, uh, a handful of youth from within the schools that are in Capitola or that serve Capitola, so like SoCal, Santa Cruz Gardens, Main Street. Um, I would need to identify if we would be transporting them to the pool. And so that's the, the limiting factor. If we were doing the transportation, which is a pretty strong barrier for individuals in order to learn to swim, um, then that would create a smaller number of individuals. If we are not providing the transportation, then that opens up the door to us significantly more. Um, we are also, I've been in conversation with SoCal High School School and the county. The county is currently under construction, so there's not much of a conversation right now. Um, but SoCal High is definitely interested in um, having that, uh, but there's still a lot of steps that would need to happen as far as the rental costs. Um, where we fall within their pay, uh, pay tier and that sort of thing. So um, it is a, it's a moving target, but the feasibility, I feel like we could definitely get um, a handful of kids. I would, I would shoot for 20 within this first year, but I would hope for more. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, again, oh, Council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Nikki, um, I, I guess I just have a comment about uh, the, the scholarships. And what I'd, I'd like to see or encourage you to explore is the accessibility to the scholarships, meaning that we were so restricted in who we could give scholarships to prior um, with the funding from the county that, um, you know, when we look at what a thriving community is or a successful community, healthy community, that's when these kinds of services are free to everybody. And often, you know, of course I want us to serve those very low, low income families, but I would like to see that extended to the, um, you know, the medium income families or even just everybody in our community. That would just be a goal that um, wouldn't it be great for all kids, every kid in, in the city of Capitola to have these for free to them, no matter what household they come from. So um, that's that's the pipe dream. That's my big dream. But until then, with this type of funding, um, I would encourage you to to open this up to to many because we know what a livable wage is now, and it's not the low low income that we're seeing all families affected by um, price increases for for a lot of things. So, um, but thanks for everything you're doing. This all sounds great. Yeah. Um, so I think you'll be happy to hear that. So with, with our partnership with the county, that was a, a very unique circumstance. And the way that our scholarship program operates, um, we're not under those same restrictions. And so we currently work with the Capitola Foundation um, and they review our scholarship applications 
and provide scholarships on a percentage base. So we have individuals that are currently enrolled in our after school program or, in, or will be entering into camp and junior guards who have received a 25% scholarship, they've received a 50% scholarship, or if their economic um, picture warranted, they would have received a 100% scholarship minus a um, registration fee that is a small nominal fee. So um, we're, we're very excited about that partnership uh, with them as they review our scholarship applications and it has served us well for a couple of years now. Thank you for that. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I have just a couple more slides on additional items before we get into the uh, capital improvement program. So at the uh, May 4th meeting, um, there was a request to provide a, uh, I guess, a, a, a clearer picture, a cleaner calculation of how we come up with the reserve funds. It was kind of all rolled up into one line item. So um, our reserve fund targets for the contingency and emergency reserves are a percentage of general fund expenditures that do not include internal service charges or transfers. So those um, expenditures include personnel, contract services, training and membership, supplies, and grants. And you can see um, across the top there, by fiscal year, what those amounts were. So just going left to right in fiscal year 1920, those total expenditures were 13 million 362. So for the contingency reserve, the 15% target was two million, was slightly over two million. We were at two million 61, so we were $57,000 at the end of the year, $57,000 above our target. And then kind of the same calculation for the emergency reserve, only at 10%. Um, so the target was 1 million 336. We were at 1 million 374, 37,000 over. For this fiscal year, the proposed 22-23, um, we have added some of the council goals. I think I want to say it's around 650 to $700,000 of kind of general fund expenditures, which is causing our um, reserve target to kind of creep up above where it would be next year. And then, so what we did was we looked at what was the target at the end of 23, 24 and kind of made level contributions this year and next year to make sure that we're on target by next year rather than put a bunch of funding in this year just to pull it back out next year. And then the last item I have um, is a measure F summary. So um, measure F, went into effect January 1st of 2018, and you can see it um, across the top there, our fiscal year, 1718 across for this fiscal year, revenues, um, what we budgeted, and then what we actually received across the top. So through fiscal year 2021, we had budgeted 2.6 million, received about 2.5 million, so we were about $160,000 below what our um, budget was. But um, we don't spend, so, so that's kind of on the revenue side. On the expenditure side, we program, we budget basically every dollar that is in the budget, but we spend more in line with what actually comes in the door. So you can see um, by fiscal year what we've budgeted and uh, what we spent each year. The first three projects there, Wharf, Jetty, and Flume, are multi-year projects. Um, Jetty and Flume are complete, came in under budget, so they're actually kind of returning some of that funding back into the measure of pool, if you will. Um, the remaining things on the bottom there, the 2017 and 2020 wharf repairs, the purchase of the beach loader and the Grand Avenue path repairs were all one-time things. Um, that's why those budgets are, are pretty much on, on spot on. Grand Avenue path did return just about $8,000 back into the measure of pool. And then they, what that does is it just, uh, we adjust the um, work budget based on, on what the actuals are. So um, I will do a true up at the end of this fiscal year. I suspect that um, we have a total budget since the inception, since Measure F started of just under 4.6. I think we're gonna be very close to that over the long haul and that we won't have many adjustments to make to, um, to, to the, the work budget basically. But 
this is something that the um, SAC has also asked me to return with once uh, we have our final numbers for uh, Measure F receipts, which will be August. So I can, if there's any questions on those last two slides, we can take those right now or we can move on to the CIT budget. Any questions from council members? Uh, Jim, I, on the Measure F slide um, for the year 2021, oh, yes. it, it shows separate um, Measure F funds going to uh, public safety, uh, but that isn't replicated in um, any of the other fiscal years. Um, so was that, was that just a one-time uh, um, expenditure for public safety? Um, thank you for that question, Mayor. I, I kind of glanced over that. So um, in response to the um, COVID pandemic, the fiscal year 2021, we left all of Measure F in the general fund and applied it to operations. And that was basically to avoid layoffs. Our biggest expense was personnel. If we had to make deeper cuts, if we had pulled Measure F out and had to make deeper cuts, it would have probably resulted in either greater um, concessions from employees or actually layoffs. So that was the one year where we left that in the general fund to cover operations. I see, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that, I'm going to move on to uh, the CIT budget and turn it over to our public works director, Mr. Gifford. Sorry about that. And now she broke on me. Good evening, Mary Council. I'm proud to present our capital improvement program. Um, as we do, typically we'll review projects that are constructed or under construction and kind of go through what we're still working on and then our allocations um, from this year's funding. So we have three projects, um, all reasonably large that are under construction right now uh, in various phases. First is the uh, traffic signal uh, adaptive control project on 41st Avenue. Um, the Budget there, you can see we have a $760,000 airboard grant, actually two grants, and $100,000 from the general fund. Uh, that project is uh, the capital side of it is is complete and is gathering data right now, so we can go to adaptive controls probably in the next couple of weeks. The Caltrans side has been delayed, so it's a matter of getting Caltrans uh, to review and approve plans. They're, they're working on it, um, and I anticipate that'll be done in, in the next uh, six weeks. Uh, Claire's Wharf traffic calming is currently out to bid. Uh, we have an estimated budget of $1,153,000. We have, as you can see there, a total funding of $1.24, $1.25 million. So we have a little bit of cushion there, about $94,000 in cushion. Um, we're hopeful that we'll bids will come in lower than our projected estimate and provide us a, a bigger cushion for that project. If we have a big enough cushion, we may look to try to add, uh, not necessarily to this project, but to the um, project below, the pavement management project, which is uh, we've built in phases. Um, the phase one, the city completed, and we did dig out and pavement repairs throughout the roads that are getting worked on. And then we partnered with the county to do the road resurfacing. That project is beginning uh, early in June. I don't know if it's beginning June 1st or the week of June 6th. Um, it's all over the county. The work in, in Capitola is part of that. They haven't given us a final schedule, but certainly uh, early in June to the end of June, we should be seeing work on in Capitola with that. The total funding for that project is $622,000. We have a current projected cost of just under $580,000. We have about $42,000, $43,000 um, balance. As you know from previous painting projects, it's always difficult to exactly nail down the quantities that will be used on a project. But that, um, we feel comfortable that that 
contingency will allow us to complete the project without adding additional funding if we talk, uh, when we get to the end. Next slide, Jim. So these are the projects that have been funded in previous years that are currently underway. Some have been on the books for a while and some we're, we're working on uh, seriously and getting very close to putting out the bid. First is the Monterey Park Avenue um, pedestrian pathway. This is the pathway that goes from the upper parking lot here behind City Hall up to Monterey and Park Avenue. Um, we've been through very um, multiple design efforts on this. Uh, we're trying to coordinate uh, with what the county is designing for segment 11 of a trail, rail trail, whatever you want to call it, um, and where they're starting and stopping and how we can interface with that. Um, I think it, six weeks ago we went before, came before council and recommended that we look at a new route that goes basically it follows the roadway behind the curb. That'll take us out of any any work that the county is doing on the rail, uh, the rail corridor, and allow us to proceed uh, quicker. All the designs have impacts on oak trees. Um, our, our design engineer is working right now in the redesign to try and minimize those impacts to the oak trees. We anticipate having a preliminary design from him probably in the next three to four weeks. Um, if we do go to sidewalk, we do anticipate the funding that we have of about $220,000 will be sufficient. Um, if we get into a lot of retaining walls or other work, we may need additional funding, but we won't know that until we finish the design that's acceptable to the council. Kristen Park is what we're working on the hardest right now to try and get it out to bid. We're in the final design. You know, we've had a lot of workshops on this and a lot of design drawings shown. Um, Having those and, and what you put out to bid are always a little different in the specifications. So I know my staff and Mike Arnone are working on that very hard. We hope to get that out to bid in the next month. Uh, based on our estimates, the, uh, we do have sufficient funding. We don't have a large contingency there, but we do have, um, we have to, we're hoping we, we uh, come in under budget on that. Next project's probably one that's uh, it's, 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 a, it's a reach. Uh, we have funding right now to do public outreach on the roundabout at Bain Capitol Avenue. We have not started that work um, because in order to do it, we need to complete the project under it, which is the utility underground. And um, pg and &E is working on this project. Um, it's been difficult to coordinate that project with them. They uh, work in fits and fits and fits and stop and go. So we had a meeting maybe six weeks ago with Caltrans and we kind of uh, expressed our frustrations with the project. Uh, that seems to have gotten them going again. Uh, we did get some preliminary design plans finally just this week, uh, but there are meetings to finish up and figure out what their final cost estimate is. They are kind of telling us that they don't think there's sufficient funding um, in our Rule 20A money to build the project. Um, I think it's about $2.1 million in that fund, um, the pg e Health Fund. Um, but they're saying we could be off by as much as a million dollars. Um, and we keep asking them why, what's wrong, how did we get here? And um, that's where we're having trouble communicating with them. But anyway, we will end up with a real estimate, not a pg e estimate, probably in the next month. Uh, once we have that, um, we'll have to make some decisions. Maybe they'll be easy decisions. Maybe they'll be hard decisions. We don't know. Um, but we'll keep the council informed on that. So getting back to the roundabout, um, until we know what we're doing with the undergrounding, we're not proceeding with any public outreach. I don't want to expect any expectations that the you know, roundabout is feasible in the next short period if we're still trying to negotiate with pg &E. Uh, next project is emergency power at City Hall. We're trying to get proposals with all these problems, getting things made these days. There's a shortage of just about everything. Um, we have a request for proposals out. We're trying to get responses, um, still working with that. This project has been continued by Cal OES, who's provided the funding um, for $300,000 because of the problems with getting delivery and parts on these types of projects. Um, if all goes well, we would have this built by the end of this calendar year. 
And finally, it's the WARF project. Um, as you know, it's uh, another project we're hoping to get out to bid. We plan on getting it out to bid this summer. Um, this is the summary of the existing funding that's in the project. We also added additional funding uh, in the mid-year review. I think that was what it was. Um, that we'll show on the next slide. But uh, the takeaway from this, that shows the measure F, we have about $2.2 .2 million. Grants and other, we have about $3.7 million. So we, right now, we have about $5.9 million. We have expended close to $1.2 million. So the $4,732,140 is what we have that we're carrying forward as we work on the project. And that'll show up in the next slide, Jim. Thank you. So these are the appropriations from this year's funding. A lot of it was taken at the, when we reviewed the mid-year or, or did the council vote, that's the word, excuse me. When we did the council vote and we allocated uh, funding that was available at that time. The first project on the list is the City Park uh, Universal Design Project that was originally identified for uh, the library, but I think uh, Councilman um, Brooks asked to move it to Jade Street. I've kind of left it undesignated here, but um, certainly I, I agree with that the project, the part that makes the most sense to do this. We have $150,000 of general fund measure F money in there. Um, that project, I'm going to give us, when we finish these slides, uh, kind of a quick snapshot of what the universal design is for a park. Um, we are also met with the county park, Friends of County Park, who uh, did fundraising for the park on um, Chanticleer. They've indicated a willingness and an interest in helping us raise money for a park and for um, improvements at Jade Street Park. So once we kind of know what our funding level is and confirm what we're going at Jade Street Park, we will formalize an agreement with them, bring that to council, and kind of kick this project off. The next project that received funding um, during the council goals was the Stockton Avenue Bridge Protection Project. This is, uh, as we're talking about, flooding is, is probably the primary issue with trees touching on the, the uh, Expansions that come into the creek, the, or the piers that come into the creek. We completed a study, oh, three or four years ago about best uh, ways to address that. Obviously, the best way would be to replace the bridge without any in withstand piers. The cost of that and the impacts to that are, are huge, so we kind of deferred that solution. We came up with a solution to put some uh, protection on the upstream end that would deflect the trees that are coming down and hopefully prevent them from being caught. About a $350,000 project. Um, if when this budget's approved, we'll kind of figure out the best way to move forward. We're also looking at potential if that we need additional funding. There are grants, seem to be quite a few grants out right now to address flooding or sea level rise issues. And we may be looking at that once we kind of get a, a better firm idea of what the final cost may be. That project's going to take a while, as you can imagine, building in the creek. Um, it's going to involve quite a few permits, uh, resource agency permits. Um, I anticipate going through the environmental review. Right now, I, I would estimate that's probably a three-year project to complete. City hall maintenance, the next two city hall maintenance and the community center maintenance are both uh, figures to try and uh, un unidentified work right now, although uh, the community center, we have a better idea what we want to do. We just made repairs that have been long outstanding, and we've been kind of waiting to try and figure out what we want to do with both City Hall and the community center before we invest large amounts of money. But at this point, we feel we need to do uh, some repair work just to keep the building open and operational. So we'll be working on that. Uh, obviously, as we move forward with some of the other ideas going through on the community center, um, this money will be available for seed money if we go for a larger project. Finally, going back to the capital wharf improvement. During the goal setting session, we did allocate another $1.5 million to the project. Um, some of that, I think 400,000 of that was general fund and 1.1 million was measure F. So adding that funding to the 
$4,732,000. We have just a $6,212,000 for the project. Right now, our construction estimate is $700,000, leaving us about $767,000 short. As to the full project, I want to stress that we have a $6 million project that we can put out to bid, and that's actually what we're working on completing the plans for right now. Um, the larger projects include uh, redoing the floating docks and installing the bathrooms. Those can certainly be done as a later project. There are, in fact, different contractors that will probably do them if we put them out together. Um, if funding's added, we, it's possible we could change order this. As you all are aware, we have a $3.5 million ask with Senator Panetta's office. Um, sorry, Congressman Panetta's office. And uh, we should know about that. Um, their budgets are approved in September. Uh, I think we would know sometime probably in August whether that's going to be quite successful. Um, so what I'm proposing is we move forward with the $6 million project now, get that out to bid, get, some pro get that project rolling. It's going to take, you know, nine months to build this. We're going to have the flows work during that time. We can start doing that over winter um, rather than next summer. That would be best. And the final project here is the pavement management for next year moving forward. Um, the resources we have for that right now is Measure D uh, and Senate Bill 1. We have about $587,000. I know we had said we'd be talking about streets at this meeting, but I apologize. We are planning to come forward with a full payment management report. We did a lease study, reevaluated all the roads, and that consultant is also working up a draft five-year plan, and that will be coming to the council on June 9th. So at that point, we can talk about what streets they're recommending, streets you guys would like to see um, brought into the program. I will say that when we um, applied for a grant with the, RT, with the, uh, with the RTC um, back uh, three months ago, we did indicate we wanted a project on 41st. We were received a half a million dollars, which is part of it's in the Claire's project, and the other part will address the intersection of 41st and Capitola Road. But at that time, we also pledged as match money next year's uh, Measure D and SB1. Um, we're unclear. We're trying to work with the RTC if we don't spend all that on those two intersections, if we can use that on other projects, and I anticipate we will. So we'll have that information when we report on June 9th. So going to the next slide, I just wanted to talk about inclusive park design or universal design. A um, universal design that's kind of learned is a term used uh, by architects uh, for not just parks, but all public spaces that opens them up to everybody. When I've looked at individual parks, they call it inclusive just park design. So I've stuck with the inclusive park design at this point uh, as we move forward since all the play, play equipment is identified as inclusive. So inclusive park design is really taking a park beyond the ADA requirements and making it open and easily accessible by everyone of all abilities. Um, ADA, I mean, Gate Street right now meets ADA requirements. It has a sloped ramp down to the wood chip. Um, it has some features that can be used. But as you know, a wheelchair or, or somebody on crutches trying to work on those wood chips um, is difficult. So it's not really as inclusive as we would like. So the inclusive design um, is designed to have multiple play experiences, developing motor skills, physical skills, and cognitive skills. So it's more than just swings and a slide and you know, climbing structure. It's all sorts of different elements that are easily accessible. It's designed for all children um, and graduated ranges. Usually when we talk about children, these types of parks are from three to 12 years old. Um, it has different play areas and different play structures or elements in organized areas so that you, know, you find your, your level of what you wanna do that day and you can stay in that area. Probably the biggest thing is improved accessibility. It does require the rubber matting like we have at the top lot at the library, but it replaces the chips. 
that is a much better uh, pathway and much easier to, to walk around um, and then get around. So, and it's completely level so that there's no transitions or gradual transitions only. It also includes safe areas. Um, not all kids are comfortable playing and being loud and, and, and playing hard. So it does include quiet safe areas where children can find their own space and do uh, how, whatever they want. And it's also becoming social, uh, welcoming social areas. So children can play alone, they can mimic what they're seeing other people do by watching them, or they can play in groups. So if we look at the next slide, this is Leo's Haven, which um, I think is the first all-inclusive park in, in uh, Santa Cruz. It's on Chanticleer. So I'll start with the, the walking surface. The greens, the light browns, the dark brown areas are all the rubberized mat material, and they're all level. So you can get around this park um, easily. It's all level. It's all easily accessible. And then you can notice all the different elements around it. Yes, there's a, a big playing structure, but if you see on the left-hand side, there's a, a ramp up to it, which allows people with difficulties in mobility getting there without having to climb the steps or anything like that. That ramp continues so that they can access the slide potentially or different play areas. But beyond the, the large play structure, there's the swings, different types of swings, depending on your ability and your age. Uh, you can swing on them. There's a tractor here on the right-hand side that you can go climb around. And one of the biggest things is there's a fence all the way around it um, just for protection, so parents feel safe taking their kids there. So it's really a park designed for everybody to use. Um, there's been lots of support and praise for the Leo's Haven. There's several other um, parks like it that around in different areas, but I thought this was the best one to close to us. So I think that's my last slide. I'd be happy to answer any questions I can at this time. So. Council Member Brent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. I was wondering uh, in regards to the city hall maintenance, um, do we know at this point how that money will be allocated to different projects or if this will be just decided at staff level or at council level or if it'll be one big project or a bunch of little ones is there any um insight as to that yet our biggest goal and we're hoping to take care of it through the uh solar project on the roof is to take care of the, the roof here if we, if we need anything we need a roof that doesn't leak every time it rains um besides that i don't think there's any Specific allocations, I know in the past we talked about recarpeting, we've talked about painting, um, and may potentially remodeling the bathrooms downstairs. Um, but yeah. certainly as we move forward, we will, we will, the council will have the final say on where that money is spent. Okay, yeah, I appreciate that. We, um, we received a, an email from a former council member, Stephanie Harlan, who had asked about the bathrooms, the floors in the bathroom, and I know that that's something that even she was concerned with when she was on council. And of course, it's um, one of our public space, you know, public areas that members of the public will go into and kind of get a um, a feel of our our city's facilities. So it, it's probably a good idea that we do what we can to keep that uh, looking as, as nice as we can. Do we have an uh, idea of how much the roof might cost? I have no idea how much it costs to re replace a roof. The, the roof, the flat part of the roof is about $50,000, but we, I think most of the leaks is happening on the mansard. And so what I'm hoping is we can take care of the flat part with the solar project and then have the mansard, which I think will be about twenty dollars to $30,000. But that's an estimate on my part. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's all I can uh, expect. Okay, perfect. And you said pavement management. We're going to go into detail on all the, the roads and whatnot on, on the 9th, correct? Yes, that's correct. All right, great. Thanks so much, Steve. Council Member Brett. Thank you, Mayor Story. Thank you, Steve. Um, so at our last meeting, we talked about, or I, I suggested we increase the City Park Universal Design Project um, to 300, and we were waiting to see what information you would bring forward. And one of the kind of basic things that Friends of Parks, I always say it wrong, Santa Cruz Parks and Friends, um, suggested was the quick fix with the squishy stuff. Were you able to figure out how much that would cost to to do if 
you know, if we did do the basics and let's say this partnership and this fundraising effort wasn't enough um, and we just wanted to do that one piece, should it, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I estimate that'd be about 260 to $300,000 just to remove all the chips that are there and put some, put in that rubber matting that's there. We've, we've actually okay. got two proposals on that, so I'm pretty comfortable with that price. But I, I just, I think you know, um, if we're gonna put new equipment in there, then we wanna wait yeah. to do it again, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was my hope is that if, and I know this was one of the concerns of our mayor, you know, um, if we just did the basic, which is the squishy, we would need more. Um, and then should the partnership and the fundraising efforts go really well, then we can see it look like a potential Leo's Haven. But if it doesn't, I really would like council to support just the basic funding for um, squishy stuff because that does alleviate. I wish I knew what the squishy stuff was called, but, <laughs> um, but it would alleviate a lot of those problems of children having access with wheelchairs or, you know, whatever, um, they need to get to the play area. Um, okay, great. Uh, I, I actually don't know, so this is a question maybe for Jamie um, about next steps to requesting something like that or getting the buy-in from council. What would be the best way to go about asking for that? Because I know so, it's a direction tonight. Yeah, so what we would be looking for this evening is if council does, we're gonna get all the way through the presentation or we had kind of the the key points, but it would ultimately be a motion about uh, directing staff of where to either make changes or allocate funding in this year's budget. Okay, so it wouldn't require a formal motion. Um, we would do that formally in June for the final budget. I think if you were gonna be making direction uh, on the budget, I think we would like a motion this evening, um, but I think we do have a spot for that sort of here at the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from council members? Um, Steve, um, I, had a, I had a question, and this is actually about a prior um, capital improvement project, um, the library. Um, and, um, and it, it's related to our, our current budget. And I was noticing on our library uh, uh, page, on page 102 of the budget, that um, and of course we had a seven hundred thirty-two thousand um, dollar fund balance uh, left over from that project, and um, it was, and it appears from the budget uh, that it um, that the fund balance is just being maintained in the library reserve, um, and um, but and I was one wondering uh, why that is and. Um, I thought that uh, excess money was going to come back to the general fund at some point. But are there future needs for the library that this is being held for? So I'm going to ask uh, Finance Director Mulberg to answer that. I was under the impression that it would be reallocated. You are correct, Steve. It has been reallocated. Um, that's a good catch. I need to get that money out of the uh, library fund and return back to the general fund. That was part of the city council goal. We had that money included when we allocated the 3.5 million. So we've already spent it. It's been um, allocated. I'd have to go back to the budget goal. It was kind of put into that big pot of money, if you will, and then reallocated to city council goal. I just need to move it out of the fund and back over to the general fund, but it is being counted in um, what we're doing this year. In projects that we've already uh, are identified. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, are, there, are, are there other questions at this stage? Um, and I'm also, I mean, just, I'm noticing that we have no attendees this evening and Larry just confirmed there, there are no emails um, Mayor Story, we nope, we have not received any emails on this item. Okay, so um, I'll check again before we conclude uh, this evening. But um, why don't we go ahead with the um, uh, staff presentation then? 
Yeah, I just have a, a few more slides to go over. So um, I wanted to touch on the equipment replacement fund. We didn't really talk about this um, during May, May 4th, and I actually didn't bring it up much um, with the fact the other day. But um, just to kind of recap our equipment replacement fund, because we have a lot of activity. We're, we're estimating that we're going to start the year with about $850,000 in there. Part of that is, um, well, a lot of that is the buildup for the electric food super. Um, we're also going to contribute another $105,000 um, in ISF charges for the department's purchasing equipment this year. And then um, we, as you're well aware, we received the um, $250,000 grant from CCE for the electric street sweeper. <clears throat> so um, as far as per proposed purchases for this year, the total is 105 which ties back to that ISF revenue charge. And they include um, a new lifeguard tower, a uh, new motorcycle in the police department, and a traffic speed sign, one of the solar traffic speed signs. Um, we do have a couple of things remaining from 21-22, the street sweeper that we talked about. Um, I believe that we have placed an order for that, but it's probably nine to 12 months out. And then um, we had a public works truck, three quarter ton truck with a dump bed approved last year that because of um, supply chain issues, we haven't even been able to order yet. So that one's still kind of hanging out there. But assuming we did all of these purchases, um, we would still end uh, the year with an estimated fund balance just under 409000 in the equipment replace, replacement fund. Um, a couple of remaining follow-up items. Actually, Nikki already touched on the first one. Uh, there was a, a question about the reprogramming at the library, and she mentioned um, she and her staff are meeting with library staff on May 26th. There was also a request for the local business groups to provide a report on their use of restricted POC. Um, the BIA will bring their resolution of intent to levy assessment along with their annual report to the uh, June 9th council meeting. And I'm working with them to uh, kind of elaborate a little bit more within their annual report on how restricted POC funds are used. Um, we've also reached out to the chamber and we're attempting to have them provide an update at the same meeting. So it's kind of a nice little they're, they're on the same meeting and it just kind of flows together with what they're doing with restricted POC. So hopefully that those both happen on June 9th. As far as next steps, um, we obviously we have a budget hearing this evening. Our next budget hearing is scheduled for June 1st if we need it. Um, we have a regular scheduled meeting on June 9th. The SAC has a special meeting held, uh, scheduled for June 14th if we need it. And we have a final fourth budget hearing um, if we need it for June 16th with the intent of bringing the budget for adoption to City Council at June 23rd. Um, we were pushing a little bit for June 9th if possible, but I think we need to hear from the BIA and their budget before we can adopt our budget. So we're still targeting June 23rd. And then the slide that Jamie was alluding to earlier to kind of tie all this together is recommendations. So our recommendations this evening is to receive the fiscal year 22-23 proposed budget and identify any additional questions um, that we have that we can either answer tonight or, or at a future budget hearing. And then to provide direction to staff on the proposed budget. Um, on the first part is funding for the ECY3 community grant and or recreation program. And we're looking for input on both the ongoing revenue of 61000 as well as the 51000 fund balance. And then I have listed here maintaining $1.3 million general fund balance if there is a desire to add funding to either the um, universal design play structure or any other project, which is probably where we would pull it from. Um, and then the final recommendation is either to continue budget deliberations to June 1st or cancel remaining, remaining budget hearings and direct staff to prepare the final budget for consideration on June 23rd. And with that, we are open for questions and discussion. Jim, on, on that uh, uh, last point um, on that slide about continuing the budget deliberation uh, up to June 1st, I, I in future report, you mentioned that we were going to be um, being presented with a more detailed project management program. 
um, at our meeting on, I believe it's our June 9th. Um, and so I just, does um, that management program, um, should we wait before concluding the budget until we uh, hear that, the details of that? Or? I don't believe we need to wait. Uh, the funding that we're using for pavement management, Measure B and uh, SB1 or RMRA, are, are restricted to street projects. So whether it's pavement management or some other kind of street project, um, that, that, that's fine. If we were going to, um, so that's revenue coming in. If we were going to do pavement management, I'm assuming we would come back um, following the June 9th meeting with a detailed plan on, on which pavement management streets we're going to, to hit up for 22-23. But I think as far as um, adopting the budget, whether it goes to pavement management or not, those are in restricted funds and we can do that after the fact. They're not going, getting commingled with the general fund at all. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks for that clarification. Um, so, uh, yeah, Council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, I would like to take this as an opportunity to request that um, I, I, well, I should first say that I am in agreement with all of the recommendations as presented with a, um, with one change that I, I uh, would ask for council's approval on, which is an additional 125,000 um, from the 1.3 million general fund balance to add to the, uh, the park project. And that's to, um, to simply just do the basic fungi uh, grounds for the park structure there, um, which I think is necessary. So 125 should be a good starting spot. Um, and then that will also allow for us to contract and partner with County Parks and Friends. Yeah, Council Member uh, Brown. I did it. I was on mute. Am I still on mute? No. Okay. Um, I was just wondering if we, I'm, I have concerns about some budget items that I don't know if we're going to be able to determine tonight or in the next meeting. I know we <laughs> still need to consider, for example, like how much funding we might need to put for repairs for our community center. Um, and so I'm wondering if we don't move forward with uh, Councilwoman Brooks' suggestion for an additional 125 tonight. Will there be another opportunity to do that at any other meeting? The simple answer is yes. What's the not simple? Is there like a more detailed answer? I'm nervous that you're saying it that way. <laughs> no, the simple answer is yes. There will be more opportunities. Um, what we're hoping is, as I think as was mentioned tonight, the we're going to find out about the federal funding for the war coming up here we think by august um hopefully sooner uh that would give us a clearer picture of whether there's a shortfall in the war mm -hmm. and as you know we're working on a new lease for the community center with the school district and once that's hammered out i think we have a clearer picture about kind of when and what improvements we might be making to the community center so our hope is to narrow get those things knocked out this summer which time then i think we'd be in a great position to sort of talk about the fund balance um, but yes, we will have an opportunity to do that, whether it comes up in August or September, or it's October, or November, I can't, I can't say for sure right now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I, I love the idea of this inclusive park and I, I would like to put more money towards it, but I'm not prepared to do that tonight because I just want to make sure that we are in a good situation to ensure that the other projects that we can't quite determine yet, if we're going to be able to cover um that we'll be able to get get all of those things squared away first Jamie, I mean, just to clarify though what i mean we would need to um, take action on this budget by june 1st so you just to, be, to be clear our recommendation is to adopt the budget and what i was trying to suggest is that we can come back and talk about fund balance allocations out of fund balance and whether it's for the war 
for a park design for the community center, um, hopefully late summer. Okay, so we would need, whether it's tonight or June 1st, we would need to adapt the budget before we get the confirmation about those um, other events that will affect the fund balance. That's correct, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, that's the issue is, is we, we, those things are gonna come after our deadline to adopt the budget. Right. So that's why we're suggesting maybe keep some of the fund balance in your back pocket because these other things are gonna be developing over the course of the summer. Okay, good, thank you for that clarification. Uh, mm -hmm. Council Member Bertrand. Yeah, I have some rather small items that I'd like to request as a project for city council to consider. Um, first, a question to Steve, though, if this would involve you. Uh, how much does it cost to do a flashing light when a pedestrian wants to cross? And my concern is the uh, senior housing area on Bay. There's a lot of people over the years have complained about that intersection at Bay and Hill. And most recently, I think all of us got an email on that. I certainly got a phone call on it recently too. So how much is a flashing light thing so especially the seniors could cross with safety? For that intersection, we actually have pricing and it's about $8,000. Um, we've actually allocated some um, gas tax money. It's, um, it's a special uh, reserve fund we have, or not a reserve fund, but a special revenue fund we have to purchase that equipment. So we'll probably be placing an order for that now. There isn't any, a need right now for more money. Okay, so you are budgeting already for that? Yes. That's, okay, great. That's all I'm concerned about at this time. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I have no problem with the, um, the spongy stuff, whatever it's going to be called. <laughs> Let's do a research project, get the right day before we order. Rubberized plate surface. Okay, rubberized plate surface, okay. You know, if I was a kid and that was in my park, I would see how far I could jump the bounce. I would do all sorts of things like that. Hey, are, is there um, further uh, discussion on the, the other recommendations? And, and, I, and it seems that we um, that the funding for the ECYP community grant recreational program. Mayor Story, did you want me to make that as a motion or the recommendation? I was still confused, Jamie. If you want me to approve the recommendation with the one hundred and twenty-five thousand, I mean, I can make I can make that as a motion. Is that what you're looking for? I think that that would be best. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve um, recommendations presented with staff with an additional $125,000 to the, towards the rubberized play surface for our inclusive playground project. I'll second. And maybe then, uh, so we have a motion in the second uh, regarding the additional 125,000 for the uh, um, the RPS um, surface of Jig Street. Um, and um, before I um, call for a vote on that, um, but I was noticing that the staff is also looking for direction on the um, early childhood uh, youth program funding. Um, is, am I correct on that? I believe it's on the recommendation um, listed. The funding for ECY community grants 61,000 towards revenue and the fund balance goes to and, okay. Parks okay. and Rec. So yes. that was the recommendation from the subcommittee. And yes, staff is recommending the subcommittee's recommendation. So $1,000 to the community grant program, 51,000 for REC, and we have some, uh, Nikki outlined some proposed uses for those funds. So if that looks good, staff, you know, please include that in the motion. And also seems to me to prepare a budget too for the 23rd. 
Yeah, I, well, I think we're going to, we're going to come to that um, okay. in just a minute, whether or not we're going to conclude tonight or, or move on uh, to the June 1st meeting. But I'll, uh, I'll, I'll call on Council Member Brown. Thank you. I just have a, a question and then possibly a request um, if it would make sense or maybe an opposite order. But um, I am in favor of all of these recommendations. And as I mentioned, I'm really nervous about continuing to allocate more funding from the fund balance right now towards other projects um, that we already have funding allocated towards, frankly, um, that when we are trying to determine some other projects. So would it make sense? And if so, would the maker of the motion be willing to separate this into two different motions? Because I would really not want to have to say, you know, vote no on all of these recommendations that I approved um, if it's all rolled into one. Would it be appropriate? Would it make sense? And is that something that the um, maker of the motion would, would agree to? Absolutely. Um, and I, I, I just also want to be sure that I'm reading that we have 1.3 million in general fund balance. That is what I'm seeing here, and that 125 would be coming from that general fund balance. Okay. Um, all right. So I'll go ahead and um, and withdraw my current um, motion that's on the table, Chloe, and I will make a new motion, and I'll um, to for um, well, we'll start with the recommendations, and then once that passes, I'll make the second motion for um, to utilize that general fund balance. So I'll go ahead and make a motion to move forward with the staff recommendations um, as presented on our uh, slide here, um, including the direction proposed by e for the ECYP community grant and or and recreation programs as Nikki presented. I'll second. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Um, and uh, before I call for a roll call vote on that motion, um, Larry, just want to confirm that you have not received any emails as we have two no attendees. No, sir, we have not received any emails. Okay. Let's go ahead then with a roll call vote on the motion on the floor. Okay. Council Member Bertrand. I approve. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Brown? Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser? Aye. Mayor Story? Aye. And the motion passes unanimously. Um, Councilmember Brooks, do you want to go on to your next motion? Sure. I'd like to make a motion to allocate $125,000 from our um, $1.3 million general fund balance to increase the, um, to go toward, excuse me, the inclusive park project um, as presented in our 22-23 proposed budget. There's second. Second. Council Member Brown? Okay, that's seconded by uh, Vice Mayor Kaiser. Um, just a, a question to the city manager. Um, um, Jimmy, if we were to allocate the additional money, would this be added in with the other pool of money that's uh, being directed toward the community center? So my recollection is, is that there was $150,000 that was allocated towards, originally towards the top lot. And then based on the feedback at the last meeting, we see Name that to a universal play structure design. So my understanding, based on the motion, is, is that there'd be 150 plus 125 that would give us 275 for play structure work at Jade Street to kick off, uh, presumably a partnership to fundraise for a larger inclusive design for that play structure renovation. So this um, this funding is separate uh, and apart from the money that we had devoted to the community center uh, for capital improvement at that location? Yes, that's my understanding. That's the way we have it structured right now is that then there's a separate pot of 150 that is set aside for the community center. You'll recall that there's estimates that the community center needs probably around a million dollars of improvements, maybe 
700K worth of infrastructure and then maybe three to four hundred thousand dollars of more functional improvements for the building. Right. But the, the playground, um, sorry for belaboring this, but the playground at St. Peter's uh, cannot be um, in to the larger community center um, or you know, projects or allocations. So staff's understanding of so past council direction is that they're separate projects. So there's a community center project we've identified and then effectively a play structure project that we've identified. We could change that to the council want us to, but that's the way we structured it so far. Or, or if I may, Mayor Story, that let's say we fundraise enough money to cover everything. Of course, that's general fund money no matter what, and we can reallocate that to any project, including the community center or anything else. Um, but the way our priorities read today is that there's two separate projects, each one with 150 as of today. Yeah, I'm getting some um, verbal feedback um, from somewhere there. I'm not quite sure who. Uh, but I, I, I guess what I'm trying to get to is, you know, um, the, under the community center, we're subject to a lease, um, and and uh, which are is being negotiated. But um, if the lease terminates, I'm assuming that the pot lot or the, the children's playground would be a part of that lease termination, and we would lose access or possession of that uh, playground. Um, and so, and if that's true, it seems to me that we should maybe think of making this expenditure incorporated into our lease negotiation. So you're, you're absolutely correct that we are in negotiations with the district about a lease extension and that the, obviously the play structure is included in those negotiations. Um, how we include, you know, the obviously real property negotiations that we do in closed session. Um, but but I can tell you that staff has is aware of the, the plans for a play structure and has been taking that into account in our conversations with the district. Um, but you are absolutely correct that if there is no new lease in 2032, the city's rights to occupy and, and use the park expire, absent a new lease. Yeah. Okay, I won't belabor this point. Um, but yeah, if, if I think that if we're putting this additional amount of money um, into uh, that particular project, we should probably be sure to get credit for it and to preserve that value um, if the lease should become terminated. So, um, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll won't belabor that point any longer. And if there's any other um, any other questions on the motion on the floor, seeing none, I'll ask Tori to take a roll call vote. I just feel like I want to clarify. I apologize. This is for the motion to allocate 125 thousand from the general fund balance towards an inclusive park project at the community center, correct? Okay. That's my understanding. Okay, excellent. Correct. Thank you. Council member Bertrand. I agree. Council member Brooks. Aye. Council member Brown. No. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. And I'll vote aye. Um, the motion passes four to one. Um, so, I, and I think our last order of business in here is to decide whether or not we're going to adopt this budget or continue this item until June the 1st. And as one point of clarification, you actually don't have the materials in front of you this evening to adopt, but if this is the final, if you're ready for us to adopt, then we would bring back the materials on a regular meeting and we should cancel the remaining budget hearings. Correct, yes. 
I mean, I think um, conceptually the budget would be approved and it would just be a matter of we would have one final, um, I guess, look at it on a regular meeting on June 23rd. Correct. Um, yeah, do council members have any thoughts about the, um, I guess there's just one budget here in June the 1st. Mayor Story, I just have a question yeah, for clarity. I, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I just saw your hand up, Council Member. No, oh, yeah. It's okay. I just want to make sure that any of the decisions we make um, for regarding the CIT projects and things like that um, won't affect or the decision of us saying that we'll go to the final budget for June 23rd. I'm just trying to see if those moving parts all interconnect or do we need more conversation about that? Um, just in case we want to allocate the $1 million to fixing Clear Street or something like that. So I think the simple answer is, is that you'd be fine. Simple answer. Simple, I'm sorry. <laughs> you and the simple answers tonight, Jamie. I know, That's I know. Funny. I'm not sure where this is coming from. Um, <laughs> so. So we're gonna basically, if you give us the direction tonight, we have have effectively a budget package and you will still have, I think it's $1.175 million of remaining fund balance. Then we're gonna be getting the presentation at our next meeting about the pavement management report. And you obviously in this budget, as Steve alluded to, we have a bunch of restricted road funds to allocate to different projects. And council could at that point say, you know, let's throw another couple hundred thousand dollars into road projects once you see what the list looks like. So. I think you're, you're totally fine at this point, giving us direction to adopt, uh, to prepare the documents to adopt the budget. And then we'll be taking a look at the road projects coming up here in June. Thank you. Okay, with that is, um, what's the council's will? I would assume that, yeah, we would have to need to have a formal motion if we were going to, um, adopt the budget tonight and counsel the um, for the budget deliberations on June the 1st. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I guess, so are we, is everybody okay with skipping the next budget or do we want to revisit on June 1st with a more direct conversation? <laughs> I believe if we're going to um, skip June 1st, we would need to adopt the budget tonight. If we yeah. don't, no? No, you would give us direction to um, return on June 23rd with the final budget for adoption. And at that point, we would, if we make any changes between now and then, as Jamie alluded to, if we add money after June 9th to pavement management, we would bring that back and discuss that on June 23rd and incorporated into the budget. Tonight is just simply either continuing the budget hearing June 1st and June 16th or canceling them. Okay. Um, I, I am comfortable keeping a higher fund balance here like we've sort of been discussing. Um, so I am okay continuing without June 1st if we want to then adopt on the 23rd if that it, I could make a, a motion if we're comfortable doing it. Okay, there's a motion to uh, cancel the June 1st budget deliberation special meeting. Is there a second? I'll second. Yeah, and second by uh, Council Member Brown. Any further discussion? Seeing none, can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Council Member Bertrand. I agree. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. No motion passes unanimously. The um, budget hearing of June 1st is canceled. Um, and um, just checking in, staff, do, we, do you need anything further from us this evening? Sorry, I was having trouble on meetings. You're good for the evening, everyone. 
Thank you so much for the direction and feedback. Jamie, you have any problems on muting? <laughs> Thanks for all your hard work, you guys. Yes, great meeting. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to adjourn us now then um, until our next regular scheduled meeting on, on May the 26th at 7 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everyone.